uh, Colonel Jennings, Cap McCord, Sergeant Rice, thank you for the introduction. Um, very exciting material to discuss, and uh, I'm really honored to be here. This is a tremendous opportunity to, to share this material, to share this, this information with you all. Um, and I can't think of it, a tougher audience to be in front of. Uh, combatives instructors, the senior combatives instructors from across the Army are here to take a look at research I did on combatives. Um, that's, that's pretty intimidating. That's, that's definitely something uh, to prepare well for. But at the same time, I can't think of a more appropriate audience. I can't think of a better audience to convey this information to in order to create a dialogue, in order to stimulate um, discussion and, and further our understanding of combatives. So I'm both um, quite intimidated and very excited by this opportunity to present this material to you and hear your feedback over the next two days. Um, please, as, as we go along, I hope there are, there are points in this discussion, there's information that's conveyed that uh, creates questions, that creates arguments, disagreements, and that, that we bring those up because that's how we further our understanding. We challenge our ideas. Um, so with that, uh, we'll get started. Next slide, please. All right, what's our, what's our agenda for today? So we're going to do a brief introduction of where this research came from. Next, I'll talk about this was a research study. So how did we do this research study? What was the method? Why, why did we do what we did? Next, we'll talk about the elements of hand-to-hand. -hand. What, from this research, from this study method, what, what were the outcomes? What's the so what? All right, you did all this stuff. What, what did you get from it? Next, we'll talk about, very briefly, um, my background is in sports psychology and motor behavior. We'll talk about, all right, these are what, this is what this research, this specific study came out. How does that connect with the science? How does that connect with the science of sports psychology or performance psychology? And how does that connect with our understanding of how people learn physical skills? And go over just a few, you know, major concepts that came out that are, uh, that'll be of particular interest. The last piece that we'll talk about is the value of combatives. And I, I labeled it that because, um, as Captain McCord said, um, the service members, the soldiers who participated in this study, they had a lot to say about their combatives training. Um, I talked to them specifically about, hey, what was hand-to-hand -hand combat like for you in the moment? But they also talked at length about how important their combatives training was in, in many different aspects. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the end, and then we'll have an uh, opportunity for questions. Next slide, please. Okay, why study hand-to-hand -hand combat? Where, how did we get started? How did we get on this road? Um, I was at the University of T Tennessee. I was studying uh, there, sports psychology, and we did one research study there, and we looked at um, MMA fighters. And we said, hey, let's, uh, let's what's, how do, how, does, uh, how do MMA, MMA fighters, what's, what's the sports psychology around MMA fighters? And any time you try and apply sports psychology, performance psychology, you got to know who you're talking about. You can't just sit there in, at your desk and say, meh, MMA fighters, I think they need this, that, and the other thing. You know, these are the mental skills, and I think this is probably how to approach it. No, you have to go look and see, hey, what, what's been done? What kind of research has been done? What have people written? Well, what's out there? And interestingly, there was hardly anything out there on what is the mental and emotional experience of MMA fighters. Great. This is a great opportunity for research. So we did a research study on it. Um, we got some very interesting results. And after that, um, I got talking with my professors. And they said, well, what do you want to do for your final research project? OK. I said, well, I'm in the Army, and I'd like to look at soldier performance. I'd look at, look at combat performance. I said, we have, this, we have this way of taking sports psychology and performance psychology and grabbing it and saying, OK, this is what athletes do, and this is what works for athletes. Let's just stick it on top of soldiers, and it'll help their performance. And what we generally know is, yeah, that, that works pretty well. High-performing athletes, you know, they are very similar to high-performing soldiers. So a lot of the principles apply. So when we're trying to help soldiers with their mental game, with the mental and emotional demands of combat, the principles of sports psychology, most of them apply. But what I said was, I said, why don't we just look at the soldier in combat? Why don't we go to where the soldier's at in combat and ask him what are the mental and emotional demands? Why don't we apply that and then see, see what falls out? And from there, we'll, uh, we'll be able to understand how do we best advise, 
How do we apply the science of sports psychology to deal with that? So that's where we got to, and we said, well, we got to narrow that down. We can't just say all of combat. That's a pretty broad, broad spectrum. Um, so from there, I said, well, what about, I kind of like hand -hand, the MMA study. Why don't we look at hand-to-hand -hand combat? So he said, all right, you know, my pre professor said, yeah, if you, can, if you can find anybody who's had that experience, then you can do a research study just like your MMA one. So that's what we did. We, uh, we went and we got in touch with uh, MMA fi or, um, soldiers who had been in hand-to-hand -hand combat and asked them about their experience. We also tried to say, well, well maybe there's some, some, some work out there. Maybe there's some writings out there. Maybe there's something that talks about the mental and emotional demands of hand-to-hand of -hand combat. And what we found was there was a lot of material on how to do it, the physical skills, the manuals, and hey, when you're in training, do this. When you're in training, do that. OK, there's plenty of material. But what's going on in the soldier's mind? What is their experience when they're actually in hand-to-hand -hand combat in warfare? When they're in Iraq or Afghanistan and hand-to-hand -hand combat's occurring, what is, what's that experience like? And that is where we found no material, which encouraged us more to do the study, which said, great, this is a un, nobody's looked at this yet. Nobody has examined this, this aspect of combat or performance. So what we did is we need to know what that experience is. And it left us with the purpose of the study, what is, which is generally, what are the mental and emotional demands of hand-to-hand -hand combat? But there's, a, there's kind of another piece that we looked at that really drove our study when, uh, when we started examining the experience of combat. And next slide, please. So when we were looking through material on people who had looked at a little bit of combat, we looked at um, SLA Marshall, who is a World War II historian and um, or historian from World War II in Korea. He would be right there in the trenches with the soldiers reporting on what their experience was. And a lot of our modern training techniques came from uh, what SLA Marshall discovered. He said something very powerful, which really drove home, I think, a, a larger importance of why, why we need to know about the mental and emotional demands of any aspect of combat, and in particular, this study, hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he said, but the soldier does not get what is most required, the simple details of common human experience on the field of battle. As a result, the soldier goes to the supremely testing experience of a lifetime, almost a stranger. And that's, the, that's, it, it, that's at the heart of this study, the, the heart of this, this, these efforts, was to understand and make sure that a soldier goes forth not only with the skills they need, but with an understanding of what they're really going to face. What are they going to experience when they get to that ultimate testing experience of a lifetime, that being combat. Next slide, please. OK, so how did we do this? Well, as uh, one soldier I talked to, um, we got talking about, hey, sir, you know, you're doing this interview method and, you know, everything, and you want to you talk to us. He's like, yeah, well, I guess you can't, you know, you can't take two soldiers and put them in a room and say, okay, guys, uh, fight to the death, and then uh, the one who's living, um, we're going to just talk to you about that experience. It's not really ethical. You can't pull that off. Um, the other thing you can't do is you can't put on your white lab coat, grab a, a clipboard, and walk around the battlefield following soldiers saying, okay, the moment you get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, let me know. And I'm going, to, I'm going to write some things down about it, and I'm going to observe it, and we're going to learn about hand-to-hand -hand combat. No, there's, there's a, there's, it's really hard to get at. So the way we did that was first-person interviews. Um, we sat down with soldiers, service members who had been in hand-to-hand -hand combat and said, hey, tell me about the experience. And we kept it really broad because we weren't sure what to expect. We just said, tell me about your experience. What stands out in your experience? and let them, let them um, speak from there. Um, the requirement was obviously that they needed to have experience in hand-to-hand -hand combat to be part of the study. And from that, the basics of it was that from all these interviews, um, we took all that information and said, what's common? What are they all talking about? What are they generally all talking about? Where are the connections that we see? And from that, we get a great idea of, hey, what's a more generalized experience of hand-to-hand -hand combat? There's always that one individual, oh yeah, I knew this one guy, he was in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And if you talk to him, he's going to have a very powerful experience, you're going to talk to him. But if you say, well, that's hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's the experience, you might be missing out on, well, what are some other people's experience? And how might those be different? So that was the value of the study, is looking abroad across a number of different people to see what was, sa what was the same and what was different. So who did we talk to? Next slide, please. 
Okay, we talked to 17 male uh, military service members. Uh, at the time of the interviews, 11 of them were on active duty. They were all one-on-one uh, -on -one individual interviews. Uh, most were uh, non-commissioned officers. We did, I did uh, interview one, uh, one officer. Uh, most were in the Army, the United States Army. Uh, one Marine and then one uh, Rhodesian, Rhodesian soldier. That's uh, Rhodesia is the country that um, was formerly uh, Zimbabwe. Um, from MOSs and branches, we had most were in Special Forces. Um, but we had a number that were also in infantry and one uh, Salua Scout, which is the um, equivalent of Special Forces within the former Rhodesian Army. Uh, there was a number of time periods in which these individuals encountered their hand-to-hand -hand combat experiences. There was um, our, our current conflicts or semi-current conflicts of Iraq and Afghanistan, but there were also descriptions of hand-to-hand -hand combat during um, uh, Restore Hope, which was in uh, Somalia in the early 90s, as well as Vietnam and uh, the Rhodesian Bush War, or their civil conflict uh, back in the, uh, the 70s. Um, next slide. So what were some more of the details about who these individuals were? Uh, of their encounters and the encounters they described, uh, nine of the descriptions, nine of the people talked about lethal encounters in which they had to kill their opponent in order to survive the encounter with hand-to-hand -hand combat. The others talked about encounters where it was resolved without, without a lethal end to the, uh, their opponent. <clears throat> um, five of them described being wounded as a result of hand-to-hand -hand combat. And interestingly, that four out of five of those who were wounded during hand-to-hand -hand combat, that occurred when they were in a lethal, lethal encounter. Hand-to-hand um, -hand combat was pretty rare for these soldiers. Uh, most of them, they, they had one incident in their career in, that they could um, describe. Uh, a couple of the other service members in the study had two to four encounters, and then uh, for one, one participant, he described his, the number of experiences he had just as numerous. Um, all the participants in the study had, uh, had experience in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They all had either combatives training or based on what their army or their service was, they had their, their background in training. Now that asterisk is up there because that one's really important. And it's, a, it's probably one of the most interesting parts of the study. That's a caveat. That's an important mention of that two of the participants in the study described experiences of hand-to-hand -hand combat before they had training. And then later on in their career, they experienced, they uh, went through a lot of combatives training or hand-to-hand -hand combat training. And then they, had, they experienced hand-to-hand -hand combat against an opponent again. And we're going to talk about their difference in their experience. And, and, that's, and to me, that's, that's one of the more powerful uh, items of this study. So keep that one in mind. We're going to get back to that. And, and as well, most of them described throughout the interviews that they had background in the martial arts or combat sports, uh, being jiu-jitsu, judo, wrestling, boxing. Um, as one, one participant also described his background as uh, recreational brawling. So we, uh, we, had, uh, we had some characters in this study. OK, so let's see. What are we getting to for the results? Next slide, please. OK, so how is this going to work? These are the elements. And this is the general framework for what these soldiers described in their experience. This is what all 17 of them, if you look across what their experience was, these are the, these are the elements that came out. And it's built in a kind of a succession from top to bottom in order to best understand it. And what these are, these major bullets, enemy threat, decision to engage, fight or flight, training takes over, these are the major themes, these are the major elements that the participants described. Under each one, or under most of them, are some sub-themes or some subcategories, which exacerbate or emphasize or are important characteristics of that, those major, that major theme. So what we're going to do next is we're going to talk about each of these major themes. We're going to describe why those sub-themes are important and what that means. Within these next slides, you're going to see um, some quotes in italics. And those are quotes directly from the participants in the study. And I included those to give you a flavor, give you a sense and some background on um, what they said that made us think that th these were important parts, and something to kind of, to just to really stand out and, and understand that. Um, also, we'll briefly talk about what are the training implications. What is what's the so what of, of any of these characteristics that they talked about, 
Um, we'll just briefly talk about why those are important and, and characteristics. Next slide, please. Enemy threat. This is the, uh, the basic concept that you are on the battlefield, you have encountered an individual in which their behavior and the demands of the situation causes a risk to yourself, a risk to your mission, or an endangerment to your fellow soldiers. You feel an immediate and definite sense of threat. Important parts of a of, of sense of threat, um, we'll get to a little bit later, but what caused that threat? What made that threat worse? One of the first things that really stood out among these uh, soldiers was the idea of surprise. Now, surprise took a couple different characteristics. Surprise could be, hey, you went in a door, you went left, and you got attacked from the right. Some guy jumps on, the, on your back and starts digging his fingers into your eyes. That can be surprising. Now, that's pretty explicit. That's understandable that that's going to increase your sense of threat, of how much endangerment you feel to yourself or your mission or your fellow soldiers. But in the stories, there was another element of surprise that was very important very, and that really stood out for us. And that was the, the startling and novel aspects of hand-to-hand -hand combat. These, these aspects that they said, whoa, I, I, didn't really, I didn't really know that I was going to experience that. Um, for one service member in the quote here, he was, um, it was the, his one, first and uh, only occasion of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was just shocked at how well his hand-to-hand -hand combat worked, how well his combatives worked. And he said, wow, this shit works, but I was glad it worked. He was really, that, that stood out to him. Another soldier um, talked about that he felt so much adrenaline going through his body that it was distracting. He was like, I, I had never felt that kind of adrenaline before. Um, another was just surprised, again, at uh, the usefulness of his, of, his, um, of his fighting skills when he, you know, he kicked a... Uh, an opponent in the leg, and the opponent fell to the ground in pain, and his four buddies decided that he didn't want anything, of the, anything, anything more to deal with the situation. So there's a number of these little items that come up of startling and novel aspects, weird things. Um, service members describing how, yeah, well, I've always used this technique in, in jiu-jitsu, but when I went to do it with 50 or 60 pounds of kit on, I was like, oh, this is weird. I got I to gotta adapt. I got to modify it. Why is that important? Let's talk really briefly why that novel and startling aspect is important to us. When, you, when a person in performance situations encounters something novel and surprising, the situation you're dealing with in the external, you start dealing with novel aspects, you start thinking and focusing inwardly. You start trying to make sense of what that is. And what is that weird thing? Wow, why is that going on? What, what do you, what's going on? You're starting to take time, you take attention or focus, and your energy, which is supposed to be dealing with the threat, and you're now dealing with stuff inside. You're trying to make sense, and, and that distracts us. That distracts us from being as good and performing as well as we want to. Close. For this audience in here, this one is not a shocker. Um, service members felt a sense of threat the closer the opponent got. Um, most of their descriptions were, um, were ideas that the closer the opponent got, the more threatening. And in general, as one service member said, there's a natural instinct to create space. Um, probably the, the most interesting as aspect of this as part of the study was that um, these were all service members with a lot of training in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They had a lot of experience being close and physical with opponents in training. Yet, when they got into actual hand-to-hand -hand combat, they still, that physical distance, they felt a lot of threat from that. There was no longer a, hey, I have, a, I have an advantage of, of asymmetrical advantage against my opponent. I have more technology. I have more, more smarts. I have better soldiers. All of a sudden, it is this guy and I are nose to nose, and we got to deal with each other. Next slide, please. So there is a, a sense of threat. From there, you start looking at the decision-making process of the soldier. You, we started seeing some very interesting aspects of, OK, you've got this sense of threat. Now what do you do with it? What's the next step? What's going to be going on? And that next step came out in this decision-making that we labeled last resort. And it was the idea that 
the service members in this study kept referring to, hey, when I got into hand-to-hand -hand combat, there was no other option. It was unavoidable. I didn't have any choice. I did what I had to do. They felt that there was no choice but hand-to-hand -hand combat in their descriptions. And then, um, but there was also another caveat to that. So that sometimes it was their opponent or the circumstances forced hand-to-hand -hand combat upon them. But other times, they saw the situation as, hey, hand-to-hand -hand combat is the best way to deal with this situation. It is the best tool to get the mission done. Um, the service member who said this quote, he was doing um, uh, on-site um, detainee operations with a, uh, a after a post-mission on a, on a on a site in um, Iraq or Afghanistan. And he said that as he was handling this, this prisoner that um, it started turning into a fight. And that, as he said, it would have been just a street fight, maybe even resulted in gunplay, had I not been able to get control, under, control quickly and handcuff him. He thought that if I didn't have the skills to deal with this, all, the only thing I would have had, been, had to go to was, was a gun. We'll talk about the, the, what science says about last resort in just a second after we tie it in with the next sub-theme, which is fast. Fast is the idea that when hand-to-hand -hand combat occurs, there's very little time to think about it. There's very little time to deliberate, make decisions, consider your actions. There's no, there's no mini, mini MDMP going on. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, it starts quickly. The actions within it are, are fast, and it's over fast. Um, there's no five-minute round. As these service members described, he said, that it seemed like you blinked and it was over. So why is that important? What do, what do we know about science that makes that a very important aspect, that idea of fast? Well, it kind of gets back to the idea of last resort. And it's the idea that people have looked at and examined how people make decisions. They, under, they figured out that when there's very little time to make a decision, like split-second decision making, and you're under a lot of pressure, people generally they look back at their experience really quickly. They see situation. I got a situation in hand. I look back really quick, quickly through my experience. I look through all my experience I have at hand, and whatever the first thing that comes to mind, I grab it, and then I stick it into that, that problem, and I deal with it, whatever comes up first. That may explain and talk about this idea of last resort. That may get at this idea of why service members felt that I had no other option but hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was because they were in a situation and because there was so little time to decide, they just scanned through their experience, grabbed the first thing, stuck it in there, and ran with it. And we'll get back to why that last piece is so important uh, when we get into training implications. Um, the, la the last part of this decision was, or decision uh, did engage aspect, was uh, a second form of decision making, and that is the idea of flip the switch. And this is straight, a straight quote from one of, the, one of the service members. They talked about this very deliberate mental shift to be physically violent. That, OK, we are in this situation. I'm in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And I'm going to be physically violent and physically harm this other individual. And that was a deliberate mental change. Now, a lot of them didn't describe any difficulty in making that change. But they did describe, with a number of different descriptions, uh, making that change. They said things like, I switched on. I switched over. I flipped the switch. It was a very deliberate act for them. When that happened, there was no longer an interaction between, you know, there's no, it's no longer a conversation. It's no longer a social dialogue. It's no longer, hey, let's kind of figure this out. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's switched on. And the, the human being in front of me is just a form. It's just a body. They were only concerned with, how big is he? Where are his hands? Does he have any weapons? And what do I have to do to deal with the situation? What are the, the most important parts? Probably the best quote that emphasizes this is this idea that um, the opponent just became a human form, every, just an outline, and that he just became a thing. I knew how it moved, but everything else didn't matter. He just evaporated as nose, as eyes. Next slide, please. Fight or flight. Whenever a human experiences, or any kind of organism, experiences a sense of threat, a sense of threat to their survival, there is a very natural adaptive response to that 
in order w in which the human has mental and physical activation to get ready for the fight, get ready to survive. And that is the classic fight or flight um, response, which I'm sure we've all heard from in this. Uh, everyone in this audience has, has heard that before and is familiar with that. Um, and that is what these service members described too. They had that response. And the first element was that was descriptions of fear. Now fear, uh, as well as the other two sub-themes, were all, they weren't always present. It was not a common theme. These were not found in every single service member. Not every one of them talked about it. It seemed that they all talked about it based on how much threat they felt, which seems to make sense. The more threat you felt, you feel, the more likely you're to you're going to experience this fight or flight. But if you're in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation and you don't feel like your opponent's any threat, well then you're not probably going to experience these elements as much. But getting back to SLA Marshall, we want to make sure that when hand-to-hand -hand combat does present that sense of threat, that service members are aware of what these what these reactions may be like. And the first one is this fear, this negative, apprehensive feelings to that immediate risk and immediate sense of threat. And that fear was not just based on an individual sense that I might get injured or I might get hurt, but it was also, hey, this, I'm afraid, you know, I'm afraid for my mission. I'm afraid the mission's going to fail because I'm in this hand-to-hand -hand combat situation. I'm afraid because I'm isolated from my fellow soldiers. Somehow I got in this room by myself and it's just me and bad guys. And this isn't good. I'm scared. What we saw was this sense of fear, again, based on how much threat they felt, and that the most intense forms of fear, the ones that they described most intensely, were whenever they were attacked without warning. This came from the, the service members who they went through the door, turned left, and the guy attacked them from the right. They had descriptions such as, fuck yeah, I was scared. I was scared out of my mind. And that out of my mind piece is very important because we're talking about a level of fear that gets so high that it's approaching the level of panic. It's approaching the inability to actually do any kind of cognitive processing, any kind of thinking, any kind of ability to deal with the situation. That's the level of fear that some of these service members were talking about, about what is possible in the worst case scenarios of hand-to-hand -hand combat. I think it's pretty uh, self-evident about what the danger is of that kind of level of fear. But fear in general, what does science say about fear? In the short, it's much like um, surprise and novelty. It is an internal experience. You start feeling bad, you start getting scared, you start feeling a risk to yourself or your mission. When your thought process starts focusing on those kind of fears, that means you are not contributing those thought processes to the situation at hand. Attention that could be used to deal with the situation you're in, the fight that you're in, is being taken away from and being contributed towards the danger that you're feeling, and you're, and you're thinking about, hey, I might get hurt, or I'm, this guy might kill me, or I might endanger my mission. So that is this, the general why fear is an, an important avenue, and why, what is the performance aspect of it. Ferocity. These were the descriptions, again, um, that kind of connect with the idea of flipping the switch. In flipping the switch, service members talked about it was more calculated. It was more calculated, um, very deliberate use of, hey, I'm going to use violence. I'm going to get aggressive with this person, and I'm going to hurt them. Ferocity is the idea that, yeah, I've already decided that, but now I've got to add a lot of emotion. I've got to fuel that aggression with, with emotion. And it was the idea that the more threat I feel, and usually in the, uh, the more powerful experiences, the, the more threatening experiences the service members had, we saw the, the more powerful descriptions of ferocity, um, especially in the lethal encounters. Almost all the service members who were in lethal encounters where they, they had to kill an opponent uh, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we saw these descriptions. And a lot of them were using descriptions of um, predatory animal um, ideas, such as, I released the hounds, or I became like a tiger that got a, a taste of some blood. And, uh, as one service member said, I exploded on them with that emotional content, that wolverine, the meanest, nastiest animal on the face of the earth. That was the kind of idea that they were talking about. There isn't a lot of science that really talks about this. Um, psychology, 
in general, um, kind of skirts away from examining human beings in the state. But what is out there, the little bit of um, science that's kind of contributed to this, is the idea that human beings have a natural um, inhibition towards killing other human beings. Um, if any of you have read Lieutenant Colonel Grossman's book on killing, that's the basic premise of his book. And there's, there's generally support for his argument. And I think the, the service members in this study and their descriptions of having to kill an opponent in combat, their, their descriptions would support that. In that, one of the major enablers, one of the major tools in getting yourself to overcome that inhibition to kill another human being was this emotional intensity, this emotional ferocity. Again, why is it important to, to recognize something like ferocity? Because it's something that our service members might need to know that, hey, if you get into this kind of encounter, this is what you may need to use to survive the encounter. Adrenaline. Adrenaline is just what, you, just what you think it is. It's what we've all felt. Anyone who's been in a scary situation, anybody who's been in combat, um, anyone who's been in a combat sport and gotten ready for competition, heck, anyone who's just jumped out of an airplane, you are extremely familiar with adrenaline. And that was what these service members described is for adrenaline. It's that physical activation. It is that, as a lot of them described, it's the increased heart rate, um, increased breathing. What was interesting in their descriptions, though, of adrenaline was how they characterized it. And, and they said things like it was exhilarating. It was a feeling of butterflies. It was a rush. Their descriptions of adrenaline were all positive. Adrenaline's a good thing. Adrenaline is something I wanted. Adrenaline was a tool. I used it. It helped me in this en encounter. They all felt like adrenaline, that's a good thing. Adrenaline, much like ferocity and fear, was seemed to be based on um, how much threat they felt. For some service members, they, they didn't describe any sense of adrenaline uh, because they didn't really feel a lot of threat in the, in the incident they were dealing with. Um, but much like, these, uh, much like ferocity and fear, adrenaline ran, could be very intense. Intense to the point of um, such an extremity that uh, after their fight, they were, as one service member described, it was a complete adrenaline dump, and I was done afterwards. I just sat down, and I had nothing left. Completely spent. All energy gone. Um, another service member described that after his hand-to-hand -hand combat encounter, he had so much adrenaline running through him that he was just vomiting afterwards. I think the implication of this is, is clear, um, is that that amount of adrenaline that could be pumping through you, that's really hard to simulate training. That is one of those things that a service member needs to know. Adrenaline also, for all, all the combat sport uh, fighters out there, and uh, it, adrenaline is something you need to control. You know, when you're in the ring and you're dealing with it, that's something you need to harness and use. You can't just let it all go. And what we see is we see similar descriptions of that in these service members and the danger of adrenaline, both its usefulness as a tool, but its danger and how extreme it can be. Next slide. Our last uh, major theme was the idea of training takes over. This is the idea that these service members described that when the fight was on, that their physical training skills just came out and did the work on their own. They didn't have to contribute any thought to the physical skills at all. Um, as one service member said, I really believe that training instinctively took over. What's interesting is that while they needed that mental, uh, that mental shift to be violent, that the physical skills, those took over on their own. Now we get back to that little asterisk when we talked about the ser two service members who did not have training. They had hand-to-hand -hand combat counters before they had training. And that's where we get to this exception. We get this description of I, they had very markedly different experiences than all the other service members who had training in hand-to-hand -hand combat. One service member said that when he was in hand-to-hand -hand combat before he had training that it was terrifying because I didn't know what to do. We were talking about uh, the idea of decision making and last resort and fast. In other words, this service member, I would submit, he got into his situation. He had very little time to make a decision. So he looked back at his, at his experience really quick and he rummaged through his experience and said, OK, I've got to grab the first thing that comes to mind. Nothing came to mind. There was nothing there to grab. There was nothing relevant to the situation 
to deal, relevant to his experience to deal with the situation. Another service member, after he survived his hand-to-hand -hand combat experiences, he said, I swore that I would never, ever get into a situation again where I had no control of my body in fighting. Now, both these service members survived their encounters, obviously. They went on to get combative training or hand-to-hand -hand combat training. Most of them actually became quite enthusiastic in it. And then later on in their careers, they both encountered hand-to-hand -hand combat again. During those encounters, their descriptions of hand-to-hand -hand combat were markedly different and they were much in keeping with the other service members. Um, as, one, as one of them said, uh, the same one who said it was terrifying, he said in the second encounter, I knew exactly what to do, exactly. He talked about his, in, in his just rock solid confidence in dealing with the situation and he knew his opponent had no chance. Next slide. So, training implications. What do all these results mean? My, my hope is that much of these results um, give you a lot of ideas on, oh yeah, hey, I can use this for training, or that's a great idea, or that it just reinforces what you're already doing. Um, I want to caveat that I am not a combatives instructor, um, and that all these training implications, these ideas that I'm going to present to you, are simply reflections based on this research. Uh, connected with what we know about the science of psychology and human movement and how humans learn. And there were four elements that seemed to come up that I thought were worth addressing in this, um, in this forum. There are a number of other items that can come up. You could write a book about it. Um, there's plenty of others that could go in here. And um, I look forward to hearing your ideas on it. But we'll talk briefly on these, these ideas. Next slide, please. And the first one is adaptability. Adaptability is the idea of when you're in a when you're in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation, you're in what's called in like an open environment. It's the idea of we're not on a we're not on a golf course in which you're at the golf course and you get all the time in the world to kind of step up, you look at the golf ball, you look down at the hole, kind of look at the wind. All right, I think I know what, uh, give me give me the three iron. All right, you're in the complete opposite situation. You're in a hand-to-hand -hand combat situation in which there is very little time to make a decision. You have a willful opponent changing your thoughts of what to decide. Very little time, a, an aggressive opponent, and whatever you decide, you have to change probably on the fly. Because as you make one decision, your opponent has a say on how effective that decision is going to be. And you may have to change based on your opponent's next move. So that's the idea of that whatever skill set you bring to address the challenges of your situation. You're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you're bringing a number, of skill, a number of skills to deal with that situation. Chances are that that situation is going to continually change. You're going to have to take that skill and adapt it continually. So what does science say? What, is, what do we know about motor behavior that talks about adaptability and how humans can be most adaptive? And the first thing is, Whatever fighting skills you select, you want to select and train on fighting skills that are, by their very nature, very flexible, that can be used in a number of different circumstances. The next idea is the progression of training. Well, how do you, how do you get to that point? How do you get both adaptable skills that can be used in a variety of, content, in a variety of uh, context, but also, like we learned in that last bullet, training takes over you don't want to think a lot about these skills. There isn't time. You want those to be skills to be instinctual. So you want skills that are adaptable and automatic. And how do we get there? Well, science says the first thing we do is we start with blocked practice. Blocked practice is just the idea of repetition. In other words, you get the one challenge and you get the same response. Challenge, response, challenge, response. Um, this is the idea if we took a, uh, a basketball scenario. This would be the player who's just standing there dribbling a basketball. Yep, all right, I'm dribbling the basketball, I'm dribbling the basketball, and I'm just figuring that out. That's the little kid. Or I'm shooting the basketball. You're standing at the free line, you're just figuring out what are all the mechanics, how do I, okay, this is how I shoot a basketball. If you want to build adaptability, as soon as a person gets a certain amount of proficiency, an understanding of, okay, I kind of got this skill. I got the generality of it. I don't have to think much about it. As soon as you get to that point, you want to switch over and start doing what's called varied practice. 
And this is where you start working with a lot of variations on and a lot of different um, ways in which to approach this skill. If we're going back to our basketball example, now we're going to take the basketball and we're going to walk while dribbling, we're going to run while dribbling, we're going to dribble around cones, or if we're shooting the basketball, we're going to shoot from the free, free throw line, from the three point line, we're going to do layups, um, we're going to see how many different ways we can shoot the ball at the basket. The last part though is that you need to build that um, adaptability is what's called random practice. And that is where, hey, you're going to need to use certain skills, but you don't know when you're going to need those skills. You need to practice um, basically being surprised about when you need to use those skills. In other words, you're being asked to use those skills in different times. So at our basketball player, our basketball player, well, sometimes you've got to dribble, sometimes you've got to shoot, sometimes you've got to pass. Now this means that they have to have a number of different skills at this point because they need something to go to. But this is where you're going to um, work on defensive skills. Um, you're going to pick. You're going to shoot the basket or shoot the uh, shoot the ball in the ba uh, ball in the basket. Yeah, ball goes in the basket. And you introduce and continually challenge you know whatever kind of skills you're using in a in a varied in a random environment. The last piece and, uh, is the idea of dealing with novelty and surprise. And I really got a really interesting question. Well, it's the conundrum. It's the challenge of how do, you, how do you get used to surprise? Well, that's the whole point. I mean, it's surprising. It's something new and novel, and you haven't encountered it before, so you've got to deal with it. Well, how do you get used to that? Well, that's the challenge. The challenge is, 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 to, is to teach people that there's always going to be novelty and surprising things. No matter ho how good you are at something, you're going to encounter things that are novel, new, surprising, distracting, startling, especially in such a wide variety of combat. Think of any other place in the world, any other performance environment in the world, any other challenging place than combat of where you're going to encounter weird stuff, strange things are going to happen, things that you did not see in training. And the idea of training through that is just making sure soldiers know that that's, you're going to run into that. And you, that once you encounter that, you just have to say, yep, that's surprising or weird, but what is my goal? What is my objective in this situation? And so let me get, I got it, that's strange, that's novel, I'm going to just drive past it. Or, yep, I got surprised, I got the first time I understood, knew when I got punched, or the, that I knew the fight was, was on was when I got punched. Okay, yep, uh, I got hit first, I'm going to drive through it and move on. That is... That's what science says is the best way to deal with novelty and, and surprise. The last piece, which, again, preaching to the choir, but uh, what science says is that if you're going to practice skills and you want them to be adaptable, you need to practice them in environments which most closely replicate uh, the environment that you want to perform in. For us, that is making sure our training is as close to combat situation as possible training in kit, training in rooms, basically taking our combatives training and bringing it into all our other training that we do. Next slide, please. Stress exposure training. Stress exposure training uh, is the idea that there are a lot of ways to deal with stress. Stress is basically, that's that fear, that's that adrenaline, that's that, hey, I feel threatened and my body's having a reaction. The idea is that that can get in the way of us performing at our best if we're not used to and don't know how to deal with that stress. Now, there's all kinds of ways to deal with that. Um, there's, um, there's this great story from, uh, from a, uh, a, a Russian in, or Soviet intelligence officer that defected from the Soviet Union in the 80s. And he went and he wrote a biography. And uh, he tells a great story of he was standing on this uh, bridge with a Spetsnaz um, Russian Special Forces officer, and they were watching some training of Special Forces or um, Spetsnaz soldiers. And they're watching, and the Spetsnaz soldiers are jumping off the bridge into icy water, and they're breaking through the water in the winter, and they're swimming through the ice and the water in full kit to the shore and then continuing with their mission. And the intelligence officer's kind of watching, and he turns to the commander, and he's like, uh, Sir, uh, I noticed there's no safety boat, there's no safety lines, there's no life preservers, there's no, like, isn't this kind of risky? I mean, what if, what if somebody starts drowning? And the commander just looked and goes, well, if he drowns, then he wasn't meant to be Spetsnaz. No problem. That is one way to deal with stress inoculation. That is, that is one possible avenue. Or just to 
pores keep pouring stress on, just keep pouring it on until you become completely numb to it and like, okay, I got it, that's stressful. There are other avenues though that say, hey, let's do that without losing soldiers to drowning uh, in the old Soviet system or overcoming people with so much stress that they don't even know how to deal with it. Let's give them tools, let's give them understanding. This gets back to SLA Marshall's idea. And the first idea is let's, let's do what Marshall says and let's make sure that if you're going to be in a stressful situation, what are the stresses? What are you going to have to deal with? Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't know I was going to have to deal with that. Okay, now you know. Now you know that when you're, you're grappling, there's a good chance if they're on top of you, you may have a shortness of breath because you've got 200 pounds on top of your lungs. Um, Let's, let's make sure we know about that stress. Let's make sure we know um, what fear and adrenaline and, and closeness and fast. Well, you know, hey, this happens a lot faster than I thought it would. You know, I've watched all these martial art movies, but I didn't realize that real hand-to-hand -hand combat was this fast. Make people aware of that. The second part is um, building and rehearsing mental skills. Okay, let's look at what are the skills on how to deal with these stresses. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with having our, our breath compressed? How do we deal with all that fear? What are, what are tools to do with that? Now, there's, there's not enough time in this, in this discussion today to go into all those different tools. Um, but at the end of the brief, I'll, I'll point you to some references that can discuss that. But it's giving soldiers, all right, here's the fears, here's the stresses, here's some tools to deal with it. And then the third phase is, all right, let's take that understanding, let's take those tools, and let's incorporate them into our fighting skills, into our training, so that as we train and we continually incorporate it into more and more realistic situations, we have an understanding of what we're going to encounter so that our training becomes more and more stressful. That way we get to practice our skills with our mental skills, um, our mental skills training techniques to deal with that stress. They all come together, and now you're dealing with um, stressful situations using getting the, the job done that you want and, and being able to manage that stress. Let's talk very briefly about one that really stood out for these service members and I thought was most appropriate though among mental skills. Next slide please. And that's the idea of adrenaline regulation or in, in, uh, in sports psychology you know um, literature it's called arousal regulation. It's the idea that you're going to get a phys physical activation, all that breathing, heart rate, um, adrenaline shooting through you. The first thing to recognize is that make sure soldiers understand, hey, that's a good thing. All that adrenaline, yeah, it feels probably, you're probably not used to feeling that. That's, that's, that's got a lot of different uh, chemicals running through your body that your adren adrenal glands are pumping through you. But that's okay. That's good. You can use that. We also want to emphasize, though, the importance of controlling that adrenaline in that too much, if you get way too much adrenaline, you get way too excited, that it gets in the way of performing at your best. Now a lot of adrenaline is probably good, but if you start getting too much adrenaline, a couple of things start happening. One, tunnel vision. You start seeing very few things. And those things might not be what you need to. You need to keep a broader understanding of what your situation is. The second is complex skills deteriorate. Yeah, you may be able to club someone with your rifle, uh, as one service member described, with his adrenaline very high, but anything more complex is going to get, is going to deteriorate. And lastly, as another service member described, he, his adrenaline went so high that he had no energy afterwards. He was done. He was basically combat ineffective. So we view it as a useful tool and as a normal sensation. But here's the challenge. I mean, we have plenty of people out there who are in combat sports, who have been in grappling tournaments, boxing tournaments, um, but even in other sports environments or, you know, before I got up and gave this discussion, I had a couple minutes to sit there and calmly go, okay, I want to be kind of relaxed, I want to discuss, <sighs> get my breathing in, all right. When you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, it is an instant transition from whatever you were doing at one moment to you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So in the moment, you have to figure out and adjust your arousal. You have to adjust, adjust that adrenaline level. You have to, in the moment, while the fight's going on, say, is my adrenaline level too high? Is it too low? Where's it got to be for the situation? And that's where, interestingly enough, sports psychology has very little to say about it. Where there is some more discussion about it is, the, is some of the stuff from clinical psychology. When they're talking with people who have panic attacks, you got these people who have anxiety disorder. And 
when we think about it, wow, that's that's pretty different. You know, somebody who's got a clinical anxiety disorder to a hand-to-hand -hand combat soldier. But the, the secret is, or the important point is that that panic attack, there's no warning. Boom, panic attack's on, they got to deal with it, they're freaking out. How do they deal with it? What a lot of the people, uh, the researchers who deal with these people with this affliction have found is that um, incorporating and teaching them how to regulate their breathing has been a really useful tool in dealing with their panic, in dealing with their excessive arousal, of in the moment dealing with, okay, I can get back under control and get to the level where I need to be. So there's been a little bit of work in incorporating that into some combatives training. And generally what they find, what there is uh, suggest is that um, this type of breathing retraining where in, you incorporate breathing training into your combatives training, into your skill training, just like we talked about in the stress exposure training, this would be the phase two part. If you incorporate it into your training, it helps deter excessive activation. Two, it, it distracts you from emotions during your fight. It helps keep you, if you start getting scared and your mind starts wanting to go to that fear of, man, I'm going to lose my life. The idea is that the breathing retraining gets your mind on, okay, I'm focused on my breathing and my breathing is connected to my training, so now I'm back on my training. The last is the sense of control. Panic attack people, they always feel like I, I lose this sense of control. I don't have control. But if you are purposely in um, deliberately controlling your breath and it's incorporated into your training, you have a sense of control. I'm back in control of something. Um, those who are combat veterans will understand that many times in combat that is also something that would be very valuable is, hey, I just need some point in this bad situation where I have a sense of control. Something in this situation is within my control. And this is a great way to start because our breath is always in our control. Next slide, please. The impact of killing. So in our research, in our study, these service members, um, when we talked to them, we just opened up with the question, hey, tell me about your hand-to-hand -hand combat experience. What stands out to you? Well, there was no set questions of, hey, tell me about fear. Tell me about adrenaline. We just let them talk. What was interesting was that of the nine service members who talked about killing in combat, or the nine service members who had to kill their opponent in combat, all of them talked about the repercussions of that. All of them brought it up un, unsolicited by the interviewer. They all talked about, in some regard or not, that they had to have deal with that situation. Some of them talked very explicitly about it. They described killing as, hey, this is nasty work. It's ugly and distasteful. And it's very different from shooting. Um, what we saw in their descriptions, though, is that they're in the moment during the hand-to-hand -hand combat when they knew they had to kill their opponent there didn't seem to be any hesitation. They switched over, they used whatever emotional intensity they needed, and then their fighting skills went to work, and they took care of their, uh, they killed their opponent. What we talked, what we saw though, was that psychologically they had to deal with that afterwards, is that there was an impact. As one service member said, it was really personal, it drew a lot more emotion, and it kind of mentally drained me. Next slide. So what is the uh, impact of that? Um, again, I want to throw out another caveat. Uh, my, my PhD is in sports psychology, that's kinesiology, that's human movement. I, the, we're starting now to get into the area of clinical psychology, of PTSD, of um, a science that, that, that is not my expertise. So as I caveat these, I wanted to say that these are just some, some uh, very general understandings, uh, which I'm sure uh, you all share. And that's the idea that from this kind of fighting, from hand-to-hand -hand combat and having to kill an opponent in hand-to-hand -hand combat, that this is very likely to be a psychologically traumatizing event. And that our soldiers need to know that up front. We need to know that as instructors, as leaders. Um, probably some of the major points that you need to know is that in dealing with such an extreme experience that afterwards there will be some time frame in which you have to make some kind of adjustment, some kind of coping, some kind of making sense of that, that event. Um, another aspect is the idea that, hey, mental trauma from having to kill someone in hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's probably normal. That, that's normal. That is not abnormal. You're not, it's, you're not a bad soldier because you have to deal with that. And that if you are a soldier that had to deal with killing in hand-to-hand -hand combat, that asking for help, 
finding help from a mental, a mental health professional, that's a smart move. It's a smart move for you as an individual. It's a smart move for you to take care of your unit and because it will help your mental health. And it's, a, it's better for the Army in general understanding a little bit more about the stresses that you went through. And us as leaders, uh, in whatever role we are as a leader, as an instructor, or as a leader, we need to recognize these, uh, um, these signs when they happen. Um, I'm going to steal a story which a, uh, one combative instructor had told me, and I apologize for, for not getting his permission ahead of time, but he told me that he was teaching a combatives class one time, and they're going through some drill, and it's, and it's pretty intense, and it's going along, and suddenly one, in, one of the students just stops what he's doing, walks over to the corner, gets in the fetal position and starts crying. And the instructor did not know what to do. The instructor just stood there and was at a complete loss of, well, do I go to the soldier? Do I continue class? Do I call a mental health professional? That is, that is not where we want to be. We as leaders need to know how to recognize should situations like that occur. Should we recognize that soldiers are going to come back and have a, a number of different stresses to deal with and that when we put them in other stressful situations such as combative training that we may need to deal with that. Next slide, please. Okay, what is the value of, value of combatives? What is, another interesting point of this study was that, again, we didn't direct any of, this, any of the questions, but at the end, I always ask the service members, um, hey, is there any, do you have any last comments about combatives? Any last, anything to, that you want to share about the experience or anything that's come up? Um, and they, all the service members, not all of them, most of the service members talked about how important combatives training was. And they talked about it in, in two parts. Next slide. So here was the first part. They talked about just, hey, without combatives training, I wouldn't be here today. I would not be talking to you if I didn't have my training. I thought that was pretty amazing. That's pretty powerful. How much they attributed the success and the survival in their situation. Um, to, their, uh, to their combatives training. And I threw up a lot of their quotes because I wanted you not to hear it from me. I wanted you to hear it directly from them. I've, always, I've been trying uh, over this last hour or so to communicate what our findings were um, and how we, how we understood what they said. But in this case, I wanted to uh, make sure that you saw their own words. What are the things that uh, they thought were really important about this training? Next slide. The next piece is the idea that not only was combatives training important for survival on the battlefield, but there was an a, a incredible sense that combatives training does much more than just prepare you with skills. It gives you the traits that you need to be a great soldier. Um, I, I really like the one, I think combatives builds an individual warrior spirit. Or bottom line value is soldier confidence. Did it instill a greater confidence in them? Then the training was worth it. You'll see so many mentions of confidence in there. Builds confidence, builds confidence. And what was interesting was that they didn't mean just confidence on the mat. They didn't mean just confidence training. They meant it was confidence overall, like confidence as a soldier. And the, 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 really the take home from that is that uh, what science says about confidence is that it is the num one of the number one mental traits to have to perform well. And confidence covers a lot of different fields. If you're confident in one area, chances are it's going to bring, you're going to bring that confidence into another area. So that's the value of combatives training. Again, right from their words of how combatives training builds the traits that we want in soldiers. Next slide. OK, where do we go from here? So here's one research study. Um, here's one, uh, one uh, exploration of what their experience was. I think the interesting part is that how do we, how do we modify our training? How do we know? what we want to train. Basically, we have combat experience, and then we modify our training based on what we learn. The only thing that I, uh, I did in this case was that I just inserted some research methods. I just said, hey, let's throw a little science in there and take what some soldiers experience in combat, look at it through a, a lens of science, and say, how, does that, how might that modify our training? The modifications of training, though, I leave that up to this, this audience here. And, and what, what to take from it, how to modify it, what it's useful. Um, from these service members and from discussions I've already had with some of the people in this room is where do we go next with future research. Um, 
I got a lot of requests for, oh, hey, you know, tell me what were some of their stories, what were some of their experiences, and I have to, I always have to back off because according to the way we do this research, is I'm not supposed to talk about a lot of the details of what the individuals experienced. But that's what people want to know. They want to know, well, well, what was that experience? Tell me the whole story. So one thing I think would be really valuable is finding more soldiers who have been in hand-to-hand -hand combat and sitting down with them and saying, hey, uh, we're going to publish this. We're going to put this in a, you know, an army manual. Um, there's plenty of them out there uh, that, that, that publish these manuals that are like vignettes. We, always, we learn a lot from vignettes. Let's do some hand-to-hand -hand combat vignettes. Let's get a book with a full of vignettes of, hey, here's all these experiences that you might, might encounter in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, research on training. There's, uh, there's great aspects to look at on how are we training and what, what, can, what can science say more about that. Um, we've, we've looked at a lot through, of uh, sports training through sports psychology, and uh, I think there's a lot to learn from there. Research with instructors. There's an incredible wealth of knowledge here, unbelievable knowledge in this room and out there from our instructors. And the opportunity to, to get your perspectives is, uh, would be another po uh, avenue. Um, in everybody's uh, binder that they got issued in the left, left folder, there's a survey for the instructors, which is part of the, the next effort of research. And uh, I, enc I encourage you to, uh, to, uh, to complete that form and, and, and hand it in, because um, that's where we want to go next, is getting your, getting your views on what do you think about hand-to-hand -hand combat? What do you think are the important mental traits, the psychological factors? How do you train soldiers in those, in those guards? Next slide. Um, some of the selected references that I used uh, to connect the science. The first one is Comprehensive Soldier Fitness, um, CSF Prep, uh, formerly known as ASAP. Some of you have already worked with them and are familiar with them. There's some of them in the audience uh, today. Could you all raise your hands, please? Yeah, these are our members from uh, Fort Benning here. I, I appreciate them uh, coming over today. Uh, and connecting with them, uh, there's, I think, 12 or 13 sites now throughout the Army at different posts. They, are, they have the same uh, background, sports psychology, performance psychology background. They're experts in this, and they're experts in translating that material to our service members in order to improve their performance. So I highly recommend uh, contacting them for more information. Um, if you're interested in this, where this research came from, what this research is, and you feel like reading it, you can download it for free at this, uh, at this website at, from Tennessee. Um, and these last two references are where I, I kind of connected most of this material from for the applied side, for the application. Uh, both these, these books are um, they're very, they're made for coaches. They're made for um, coaches to say, hey, how do, I, how do I train better? And I pulled most of my material from there. Uh, next slide. Um, just a f some acknowledgments. Uh, huge thanks to the Army Combative School, um, Sergeant Rice, uh, and uh, Captain McCord, and all the other leaders, uh, First Sergeant. I really appreciate it. This has been probably uh, one of the highlights of my career to come down and, and give this talk. And I can't, like, again, I can't think of a better audience to present this material with. So thank you very much. Um, I thank my professors and all the faculty at University of Tennessee that supported this research. Um, it was pretty nasty at, stu at, at times. Um, and presenting this material in front of them, I was really worried that they would say, hey, you can't, you can't bring that stuff in here. You can't, this is academia. They, you don't, we don't want to listen to that. And instead, they were just the opposite. They're like, yeah, let's, we really want to be a part of that. We want to help. Um, so I want to thank them. Um, West Point and the Center for Enhanced Performance, uh, where I'm currently, uh, currently assigned, um, very supportive in this, in this research and giving me ideas and helping present the, uh, prepare this presentation. Um, I, the ideas on breath retraining under the adrenaline regulation, I have to give that credit to um, Kevin Secor, who has taken that clinical psychology stuff and started to adapt it into combatives training. Um, so if you're interested in more along that line, um, uh, I defer um, him as the, the expert on that. Huge thanks to John Rankin. This study and this discussion would not happen. This study would just would not have happened at all without his assistance. Um, I was struggling finding soldiers who wanted to talk to me about hand-to-hand -hand combat. I found one, he's like, you need to talk to John Rankin. I talked to John Rankin, and John said, just tell me who you need. How many do you want? And he kept finding soldiers for me, and he would do, not only find them for me, but he'd say, hey, this guy's going to call you. He wants to hear about your story. He's OK. He gave me that bona fides. And, uh, and I really, I really thank, thank John. That was, yeah, you're, you're such a linchpin in this, in this research. Last and, and most, though, is the service members who sat down with me and, and discussed their stories. Some of them were some pretty, 
some pretty gut-wrenching, um, uh, get you teared up in the eyes kind of stories from these guys talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat and, you know, the things that they had to do and experience in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And they, they, uh, they shared those with, uh, with me with the whole idea that I would share that information back with you and that we would do something with it and do something and, and make sure that our soldiers, when they go out and face these encounters again, that they're properly prepared. Um, so I want to thank them. And with that, next slide, please. I'll take your questions. Thank you very much.